Good morning for those that have jumped on. We're going to get started here in a minute. Um, take in the, the picture we've got there on the on the greeting page. It's it's Capital One's new uh, headquarters campus in Tyson's, Virginia. It's it's a rendering, but the campus is coming together nicely. So take a look because it's just one of uh, you know dozens of Fortune 500s we're lucky enough to have here in the county and the region. So we'll get started here in a minute. Go ahead and jump in, um, and we will we will kick off the seminar. So, good morning, everybody. I really appreciate you uh, spending time with us today. My name is Mike Batten. I lead the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority's Talent Initiative Program. I'm uh, I'm a lifelong Fairfax County resident and a 30 year uh, tech veteran. Um, I hope you'll walk away from this session with an appreciation for the investments that uh, Fairfax County Economic Development Authority is making to help. Our companies retain and recruit talent to address the gap we have across the county and the region. Plus, you'll leave you know, this morning with new recruiting partners and resources to add to your strategy. So let me just touch on the uh, agenda. First and foremost, I want to let you know that uh, we will send a, um, uh, an email right after this presentation to include all the contact information on myself, the panelists, um, once we wrap this session. Um, and uh, I want uh, just walking down through the agenda, I've asked Victor Hoskins, our president and CEO of Fairfax County Economic Development Authority, to share a few opening remarks on why, why we're in this talent initiative um, uh, program area as an EDA. Um, and then I'll share a few of the resources that we've developed to complement your recruiting efforts. Um, and uh, we'll then have a panel of a panel discussion with some key leaders from across our college, university, apprenticeship organizations that uh, hopefully will help get your wheels spinning on adding new tools in your recruiting belt. Uh, and then we'll close up with some Q&A. I'll ask a couple poll questions in, in the, in the, uh, along that line as well. So from, with that said, let me, um, let me introduce Victor. Victor Hoskins, again, is our president and CEO of Fairfax County Economic Development Authority. He holds um, degrees from Dartmouth, from MIT, and urban studies, and real estate, and finance, and economic development. He's well known across our region. He's worked uh, at the cabinet commissioner levels in economic development um, across both Maryland, D.C., and Virginia, and most recently leading Arlington County during its winning bid to bring Amazon HQ2 to our region. Um, and now Victor has taken over leadership of uh, Fairfax County Economic Development Authority in uh, August of 2019. And, Immediately, he uh, leveraged his experience across the region and developed the Northern Virginia Economic Development Alliance. So we, we're coming at this today from, from the regional approach, not just the blinders of Fairfax County, just as one example of his impact out of the gate. So, uh, Victor, let me just turn it over to you to make a quick uh, opening statement and share why we're in the, the talent. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate that. Um, let me first of all say that um, when we started this process about a year and a half ago, um, strangely enough, um, we really didn't know what direction we were going to take. And I joined um, Fairfax County Economic Development August of, of, of 2019, and we, were really, we really had to do research to figure out what direction we were going to take. Um, by April, we had figured, figured that direction out. Well, first of all, uh, Mike Batt had become the director of, of, economic, of the uh, initiative, and then um, we launched our first digital tool, which is a website, talent website. Many of you have seen it. What you probably don't know is that our first opening of that website, we had about 300 hits that month. Um, but now we average about 20,000 hits a month. Um, we have a very sophisticated digital um, targeting program, um, targeted markets all around the country, including our own. Um, we really look at uh, five major markets from New York to San Francisco, Silicon Valley, um, and of course, like I said, the DC region. And really what we've been doing is we've been trying to use these uh, virtual career fairs as our tool um, to gather uh, people who are seeking opportunities with companies that want to hire talent and give them opportunity to engage with one another. Because really that engagement is essential um, to, to really getting them moving forward. And what I wanna emphasize here is that we really are focused on four areas, retraining, retaining, growing and attracting. Four areas, retraining, retaining, growing and attracting. But the way that we do our business is we believe that retraining and retaining are the key factors to winning in this game. 
66% of all of our work in economic development when we're working with tenants or with existing companies. And I believe it's going to be the same with our time invested in talent. We are gonna focus on retraining and retooling the people that we have here. Those are the resources that are on today. They are gonna talk about those issues. And those are the ones that we feel are critically important to us winning. We know we're not in a regional competition. That's why we created the Northern Virginia um, Economic Development Alliance. We know that in many ways, we're not in a national competition. This is a global competition, but we know that we have the talent here to win that competition. And with that, I will turn it back over to Mr. Bat. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Victor, appreciate it. Um, thank you for that perspective as we jump into it. So um, before we turn, before we get into the panel discussions and some questions that I wanna ask each of our panelists, um, you know, what I want to do is, is uh, share a few of the resources that we've developed, you know, that, that really help provide the heavy lift in delivering a diverse set of talent for you. you know, we want you to consider us as an extension of your team um, where we help sell the region and you sell your company. So it's a good partnership to really help, again, keep that talent that we have here, retain the talent, but also bring in talent from, um, from across, um, across the country and, and potentially even globe. So let me, um, let me go ahead real quick uh, and stop sharing. And what I'll do is, um, what I'll do is just quick, quickly give you a, a demo of the site. Bear with me, stop sharing. I'm gonna share the site. And so now what I'm showing you is, is, a, um, is our, is our talent website. And as Victor noticed, it noted, this site is getting 20,000 plus hits a month. It's really growing. We want you to leverage it when you're recruiting candidates and just um, anytime you're, you're out there promoting the region yourselves. Um, just want to get you acclimated to it for a second, and we'll, we'll jump in back into the panel discussion. But again, work in northernvirginia.com. Um, you'll see right out of the gate, find a job, and we'll, we'll touch on that. You know, we have all the folks from our panelists today and others, you know, we have an upskilling resource, pa resource page. We have exploring communities for those that are coming out of, from, the, from different parts of the country that might be looking for urban, rural, near a metro, walking, whatever they might be looking for. There's cost of living calculators for those coming from, uh, you know, New York and Boston and Seattle and LA and San Francisco and other areas. Um, so just peruse through this quickly. Um, again, showing off the regional approach. Um, take a look at the numbers. Uh, you know, I'll just share quickly. You know, this is uh, pulling from Jobs EQ, but I just had this morning our, uh, we also have a subscription with uh, Talent Neuron from Gartner, and the numbers were pretty similar. It was about 91,000 plus across our region. So similar to what you're seeing here with about 46,000 of them in, for, in uh, Fairfax County alone. So um, it, it's, it's amazing the, the, the challenge we have, but that's again why we're in this to help you fill that talent gap. Um, so if I just click on the find jobs um, page, a couple of things I wanna point out. First and foremost, you, you can sort by industry. So if someone's coming in and looking for particular roles by industry, um, they can do that. Um, and then for you as a company, or also for someone, a candidate, we want to make sure that they know that they can come in and view by certain areas. If they say, hey, I want to work for, you know, a corporate headquarters, um, quickly it narrows that down and, and, and share some of the corporate headquarters that are here and takes you directly to, takes them directly to your site. So they can click on it and go directly to your site and, um, and search for uh, company, uh, opportunities that are uh, open directly in your company. Um, lastly, what I'll just show quickly is um, the employer resources page. This is where uh, we'll post, for example, the presentation that we're going through today. So that'll be on here. It's where you can go profile your company. We really want you to profile so that you're out here. So when people are coming from all these locations across the country, they're gonna find you. Um, and so please go in and, and profile yourself. This is where you'll, you'll find more about the company map. You can um, become a featured employee, get in touch with us on that, as well as um, many other resources. So lots to show on here. There's a veterans page. There's lots of information here, but I just wanted to give you a quick glimpse of what we're investing in heavily with our partner, 
DCI. We have contracted um, a multi-year contract with a workforce development marketing company, DCI out of New York, and they have uh, been uh, just key to us really jump starting this program and, um, and uh, this site, and they manage this site for us. <clears throat> so let me go back to the presentation. And just close on a couple of points I wanna hit. First and foremost, again, leverage this site, leverage the work in Northern Virginia that site and all the different um, components to it and the key messaging that's there. Um, promoting the, you know, the, the cost of living calculators, that community quiz on where you might want to live. Uh, but know that we, we also, we're, we're um, investing heavily. The, the county's uh, budgeted, uh, given us a nice budget to do paid advertising, promoting the region and driving traffic to this. And we're, we're promoting it through, you know, lots of different ways. You know, we're, we're advertising in tech, tech news apps like The Verge and clearancejobs.net. Um, com and military.com and LinkedIn and Google search and, and many more. So know that we're investing heavily to drive traffic to the site. So make sure you're, you're profiled out there. Um, virtual career fairs. There's one, if you note on that, on the site right now we have on there and it's with one of our Spart um, sponsorship partners, Women in Technology. Um, but we also um, are doing many uh, ourselves. We've done four virtual career fairs just in the last nine months resulting in about, there were close to 80 companies that participated in those career fairs that walked away with 3,500 um, candidates that they rated as either interview, screen, or pipeline. So lots of opportunities here. Um, we're also sponsoring many um, organizations to help with diversity and inclusion, like National Society of Black Engineers, DDPA, um, uh, which is another um, African-American STEM organization, women in technology, and, and, and many others. So again, you know, one paid advertisement, email, webinar at a time to really drive home the point we're promoting the region to help bring that talent here. Um, some stats, Victor noted, and we talked, you know, 20,000 plus hits, but just since we launched this site in last April, we're not even a year into this, um, you know, we already have 250,000, almost 240,000 plus users that have come here. But I, a point I really want to highlight, top metro areas. You, you have talent fleeing from those locations. And so we are proactively reaching out to the New Yorks and LAs and all the ones you see across there um, as, and, and really promoting the region. The site is a great place to come, you know, raise a family with unlimited career opportunities. So let me transition as we transition over to the panel and really to sort of tee that up and help the panel discussion. Um, let me just ask a quick question for, for you, the audience, you know, that, that, will, that will really help with the discussion. Have you leveraged external training certification or apprenticeship organizations to help upskill your current employees or to fill the talent requirements that you have? So let me give you a, a minute or so to, to think about that and answer that question, we'll see what it looks like, and then we'll, um, we'll shift over and start to introduce the, the panel. I think you're gonna find as we, as we shift, uh, we'll see what the answers look like here in a second. We'll hopefully see that pop up. There we go. So it looks like about 60% of you have um, participated in this and, and another 40%. Hopefully both of you will still walk away with uh, learning some, some good information on uh, from our panel here this morning. So let me transition and let's start talking a little bit more about that. What I want to point out here is, is what you see from this list is um, uh, we have a number of continuing education and apprenticeship organizations that we have partnered with, that we're engaged with, but I want to let you know it's not all inclusive. But this is a great list and we have a number of them here this morning on a panel to help you um, really talk through it and answer questions you might have and, and, and really start to get those wheels spinning, like I said. Um, so Northern Virginia with many programs and partnerships across across the, um, uh, the region and partnering at the state level um, with state and federal grant funding, 
Um, George Mason with a new university president, um, really focusing in on, on the continuing education um, world as, as folks are transitioning out that might've been displaced um, from uh, during the COVID pandemic. Marymount University is doing a lot of the same. Um, University of Virginia, you might not be aware, but they have locations here in Northern Virginia now, as well as online with uh, continuing education. Um, and then if you've not leveraged apprenticeship organizations like Reverture and SmoothStack, you're gonna hear a lot about that um, this morning. So really uh, appreciate you guys taking the time on that. So um, with that said, let me just do some quick introductions and then uh, we'll bring on the, the panel here and, and uh, start asking them some, some key questions and seeing what, uh, what they can do to help us. So first and foremost, we have Melanie Stover. Um, she's the Director of Corporate Workforce Engagement with Northern Virginia Community College. So welcome, Melanie. Um, we have John Dow, who uh, is, uh, comes from the consulting world. He's, he's worked for a number of organizations, Accenture and others, um, and has a good background that, that I think fits nicely with us in what we're talking about today. And he's Senior Vice yeah. President for Management Consulting. Um, and their marketing uh, market unit, as well as the federal practice lead for Revitcher, um, which is headquartered here in uh, Reston and Fairfax County. We have Mark Austin, the executive director for professional education and academic ventures with George Mason University. So welcome. And then finally, we have Emily Brash, vice president, business development and strategic partnerships with SmoothStack, another um, apprenticeship organization headquartered right here in Fairfax County. So um, thank you all for, for joining us this morning. I really appreciate that. Let me just dive into it. And um, Melanie, I'll ask you the first question, um, which is really, you know, tell us a little bit about uh, you know, some of the recent workforce development efforts the, uh, across Northern Virginia Community College. Sure, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this morning. Excited to talk about workforce development, recruitment, and upskilling, not only at NOVA, but with the other organizations represented this morning. So for a little bit of context, um, Northern Virginia Community College, if you're not familiar with us, we are not only the region's largest higher education institution, but we are also the largest institution of higher education in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We're home to 75,000 students who come through our campuses every year. And fundamental to our mission at the college is that we are based on workforce development issues and initiatives. Um, so our students are coming to us, all 75,000 of them, to begin, advance, or change their careers. And so we want to make sure that the programs that we offer at the college support our students in achieving those goals. We are fortunate enough to have a dedicated labor market research team that works with us in addition to our business partners, like many of you on the call this morning, to talk through and assess both current programs that we offer and future programs that we should consider offering at the college to support local workforce needs. Because we know that the trends that we see today will also potentially change in the future. So NOVA is definitely known for our extensive two-year and certificate programs that we offer at the college. We have more than 120. But on the topic of upskilling, there are two initiatives among many that I wanted to share with you this morning. So the first is around the Fast Forward Initiative. Fast Forward is a really innovative initiative that the Commonwealth of Virginia and the Virginia Community College System launched several years ago. And it's focused on short-term training. So we know many individuals who are advancing, beginning, changing their careers um, may not necessarily have the time to commit to a two-year degree. And so we have a variety of programs that are just several weeks that can support students in achieving their career goals. Traditionally, these short-term training programs are not eligible for financial aid, which can make them cost prohibitive for many students and members of our community. So what VCCS did is they launched the Fast Forward Initiative, which helps provide financial assistance for those short-term training programs. What's unique about that program, in addition to providing financial assistance, is that it's tied to labor market demand. So the programs that are offered at NOVA could be very different than those that are offered at other community colleges throughout Virginia. 
what it allows students to do is it buys down the cost of tuition by two thirds. So for simple math, a $3,000 course can now become $1,000. And there are lots of initiatives and funding resources that are currently available that can cover the cost of that first third, making them completely free. And the certifications that we offer are primarily focused in IT and healthcare programs. So medical assistants, um, pharmacy technicians, nurse aides, and healthcare. And we have a bunch of IT certifications, but they include uh, your usual suspects of CompTIA and Cisco and AWS, to name a few. Um, but what's really great is that we're able to serve hundreds of students in achieving their career goals through these short-term training programs. In addition to the Fast Forward initiative, um, I know that Mike mentioned uh, we've got some other panelists who will talk about this as well this morning about apprenticeship as a tool and channel to help grow the talent pipeline. So we know in fields like IT and healthcare, there's a huge demand and quite frankly, not enough individuals with the skills to help us fill all those jobs and they're great career opportunities in our region. So we've been fortunate to work with companies like Amazon Web Services and a lot com to rethink a traditional time proven model like registered apprenticeship and bring that into the tech sector. And the way that our model is structured is that we partner with tech firms to create short term training programs that are about 14 to 15 months through a registered apprenticeship model that prepare new hires, veterans, career changers, current employees of the organization to prepare for new roles in IT. So it creates another avenue and channel to bring in new talent or current talent into new roles and develop the skill sets that may be required in the IT sector. Um, currently, we have uh, 10 to 14 weeks of training that occur at a NOVA campus or remotely. And there, during those 10 to 14 weeks, it's basically a boot camp where um, apprentices are able to learn the skills and earn the certifications for the technical knowledge to be successful as they transition into on the job training, which takes about a year. So in about a year, you're able to work with new hires, new talent, current talent to prepare for changes in your workforce. So I know we have a lot to cover in our conversation. So Mike, I'm gonna hand it back, the virtual microphone back over to you. Thanks, I appreciate it, Melanie. Um, and I appreciate the, the detailed um, information on what Northern Virginia Community College is doing. Let me um, shift over to, to Mark now at George Mason University. And, and keep in mind, audience, too, when you're, when you're hearing from the panel, I know all of them have already shared this with me, but I'll just, I'll just note it now, is that they all want to hear from you. They all want to know, you know, what, what else can they do that, that if there's something that's missing, that's, that's not there for you to hire talent from across these areas, they want to know. They're all very successful in what they're doing now, but they, they want to hear from you. We got to work together to continually fill this gap that we have. So with that said, Mark, can you tell us a little bit about how um, George Mason is thinking about changing the economic landscape in our region and the role you know, of, of the university? Sure. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate the uh, invitation to be here today and talk about the Mason Talent Exchange, which is the concept that we're building um, to do exactly what Mike just described, which is to listen to what the market is telling us. Uh, oftentimes, universities build things and hope that um, people use them. Uh, in our model, the Mason Talent Exchange, we've taken a look across the economy and realized that there are um, exacerbated skill gaps. In other words, we've got a higher level of unemployment than we've seen in a while. Now our region is pretty resilient in that regard, but it's certainly increased. And our concern in particular is for the degree holder, someone who already has experience, has a degree, but is missing that critical skill that they need to be able to get them into a new job and a new career, especially if they've been dislocated or furloughed. Uh, so there's a pool of talent that exists out there, experienced talent, talent with degrees that are looking to fill a skill gap. And so, um, you know, the, honestly, the, the, the numbers are kind of staggering. In Virginia alone, we're looking at about 270,000 um, unemployed folks um, with degrees. It's incredible, the, the numbers. And then you look at the number that Mike showed you from Talent Neuron, we have uh, lots of job openings and they continue to grow. Uh, so that means there's a skill gap. Skill gap is nothing new. So how do we build something that resolves uh, that skills gap? 
Uh, and the Mason Talent Exchange is um, designed to, number one, build a virtual micro-credential offering for a degree holder uh, that allows them to fill that critical skill gap. Um, our goal, though, is ultimately to understand what those micro-credentials should be from the perspective of you, uh, the employers. We've worked really closely with other employers in our region, most recently AWS, and thinking about what's the need, what are the needs for cloud computing. We've also worked with um, some large companies also thinking about similar problems who've told us uh, that what they really need is for their um, employees to be able to talk digital, to speak the digital language. That's everything from statistics to data visualization to cybersecurity needs. Um, when we've taken those needs from the market and aligned them to what we're doing at George Mason, we end up with a micro-credential um, that we validate and, uh, and build in conjunction uh, with employers. We need to do more of that. Uh, so that way, as an employer, you're getting the skill that you need. And as a learner, you know that on the other side of a training engagement with George Mason, you are already teed up well for what employers are looking for. It's credibility that they need, especially at a difficult time. So that's what we're doing, Mike. I'm just thinking about how do we bridge the gap in the labor market between the need and the supply. And there is uh, problems on both sides, but we're really uh, excited about this new program. And Great, it. thanks Thanks for that intro, Mark, I appreciate it. Um, sort of shifting a little bit again, but I think there's similarities across the board and apprenticeship scenarios um, and apprenticeship like um, programs. And I'll tell you right out of the gate, I when I first was introduced to SmoothStack, Reviture, took me a little while to get the, the model, but I'll tell you, once I understood it, it's, it's amazing what they do, what they offer. And I've talked to many companies that are leveraging their services that have said, yes, it works. It's, they're helping us. They're filling our gap. If we win a contract, you know, it, it's, it's a great, great way to bring talent into our organization. So, um, so with that, um, Emily, let me, let me ask you, you know, help us again, what's the difference between apprenticeships versus internal training programs and boot camp or internships, you know, what about these programs, um, you know, what about these programs is important for the employees here to consider? Sure, thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, so, you know, um, SmoothStack being a Department of Labor registered apprenticeship, um, you know, the, the process of going through that and understanding, um, you know, the different pieces and parts of an apprenticeship and all the components and how it works is really important. And, um, and certainly for companies um, interested in leveraging, I love this uh, talent exchange program, George Mason, I think that's um, amazing. And the uh, more modern apprenticeship, um, Melanie, that you talked about, those are the solutions for the future. And so as an employer, understanding all of these different options is really important um, as you put your strategy together. And it's probably not going to be one size fits all. It's probably you know a combination of all of them. Um, but in terms of things to consider, um, you want to consider the talent that is going into the program. Is this a program that requires them to pay out of pocket or is it a program um, that's, you know, that's merit driven? Is it um, a full time job or is it paid for training? Right. So those are those are some things to consider. Um, I know a lot of employers are also thinking about how can we. Um, upskill our existing workforce, right? We have um, a you know big group of people, individuals that have been with our organization. We have institutional knowledge, and we need them to upgrade into digital skills. And, and what's the best way to do that? So internal training um, programs are a great solution, but certainly some things to consider are um, you know are you going to bring in a partner or do this yourself? Um, and then how do you run business as usual, right? So you have, you know, people that are, have day jobs and this is for internal training or, um, you know, looking at external sources of training, people have to earn a living, right? So you're dealing with um, career changers, people who may have been um, displaced and they, maybe they're working, um, but they're underemployed. We, we see that a lot at SmoothStack as people that are not working up at their potential. They're, they're working in a job so they can earn a living, but they're not doing what they want to do. So how do they balance going through an effective training program while still um, bringing home a paycheck? So, so those are a lot of the things to consider. And then you also want to look at um, you know, the types of skills that you're, you're looking to fill within your organization. There's short-term needs for, you know, really, um, you know, technical skill sets. And then there's those long-term 
um, needs for kind of, you know, foundational skill sets and people you want to bring in and cultivate into, um, into new career paths. So you have to be, um, you know, looking at all of that as well. And I would say by and large, the most important thing to consider um, when looking at uh, training or upskilling um, a group of individuals is assessing their um, talent level today, assessing their skills, aptitude and capabilities, what their goals are and their career trajectory to make sure that whatever type of training program or apprenticeship pathway that you're putting them on is the best fit for them. Um, we see this a lot. There's, there are people that um, really want to get into a certain type of a, a career or a certain pathway, um, and they're just, they're not ready yet. Um, they may need um, several steps of additional um, support, training, um, you know, whatever it might be, or just overall assessment of, okay, hey, where are you today? Is this the best pathway for you? Or may, you know, is there another pathway that's a better fit? Um, so we use all kinds of different assessments, um, Myers-Briggs types assessments, right, to help people really identify all of their key strengths um, and, you know, the best type of um, pathway that's going to be successful for them and successful for the employer. Um, because, you know, no matter how great your training program is and how many resources you provide, um, if, the, if the candidates that are going through that training program aren't um, equipped with the foundations to be successful, you know, they're not going to have a great experience and, and you won't have a great experience. And ultimately, you know, you're not going to fill, you're not going to fill that job. Um, so, you know, definitely have a lot of conversations with all kinds of employers about that topic um, and how to, how to, you know, put that strategy and solution together. So hopefully that's helpful. Thanks. No, that's, that is, I appreciate it. Uh, now, John, um, Reverture, what, what, um, what do you see? What are you hearing from your clients regarding their talent strategies? Yeah, no, that's, that's a interesting question, Mike. And, and you know, thank you for, um, you know, inviting me to participate with your panelists and, and, and FCEDA today. Um, you know, uh, and I think talent strategies is a, is a very timely talk, you know, topic in our post COVID era. You know, I saw a picture on social media the other day showing Tom Brady and, and Mike Gronkowski you know, in their New York Patriots uniforms with a caption that said, what is the cost of not retaining top talent, right? Um, you know, I, I think the better question, at least for me, and more interesting is like, what is the impact of not being able to identify and recruit and grow the top talent to start with in the first place, right? So clearly New England has five world championships. So, you know, they did something right. Um, you know, in, in a um, in terms of what we see, Mike, you know, from clients that we work with, and um, you know, talent strategy is is something that is is you know kind of on the CEO agenda, and I think more recently has been getting a lot more um, a lot more focus. In a recent survey by McKinsey, eighty seven percent of uh, C level executives said that they were experiencing gaps in the workforce, or, or expected to. Um, experience gaps, you know, in, in the coming years, but less than half had a clear sense of how to address the problem. And I, I think that, you know, um, this panel discussion is actually part of part of the solution. Um, you know, and the, the good news is, um, you know, that there's, there's, there's help, right? There's resources, everybody, all the panelists, all the companies on this um, uh, panel discussion today um, have a point of view, they have past performance, and, and, you know, and we're all here to, to help, you know, so a couple of the key questions that, you know, I would ask is, you know, how are you going to attract the right talent, not only for today, but for tomorrow, right? So we see a lot of legacy systems modernization within the federal government. We see a move to AI, we see a move to uh, robotics and production automation. So what I see is uh, often is uh, you know partners that are looking to fill a task order for a specific skill set today, um, but there's not a plan to upskill, reskill their existing workforce um, with AI skills, for example, three years from now, and and that's going to prevent them from being able to compete in the future. Um, the second point is how are you going to reskill or upskill existing resources? And I think everybody on the panel has talked about today, and I think that. Um, you know, with, with the number of uh, resource, the number of skilled, as Mark mentioned, degreed um, uh, individuals in the workforce uh, with relevant skills, 
um, I, I think reskilling and, and upskilling is is a key, com, you know, kind of key component to, a, you know, addressing talent gap and is a key component to the talent strategy. Um, you know, at, at, at Reviture, we are a technology trained uh, company. That is all we do. We recruit, hire, and custom train software developers and engineers um, and deploy them to leading, leading companies. Our resources are all, uh, you know, kind of productive day one. We recruit nationally from over 700, 700 universities, including universities that are on this call. And you know, Mark, I want to thank you for your thank you for your sponsorship. We have, I think, I was looking at the numbers, and I think we have more George Mason, um, you know, kind of alumni that have come through our program than than any other. Um, and and uh, our our training is customizable, right? So we we train based on what the employers in you know kind of the DMV area in, in Northern Virginia say that they need to to support their current programs um, and all of our all of our resources can be converted to an FTE so Reviture is really a workforce development program um, and, and to help build that not only the you know train for the skills today but we can train on the skills for tomorrow we we support over 55 different technologies at the same time um, we are a workforce uh, transformation or corporate training company where we can reskill existing employees and, and put them through the same type of same type of program that we put our Reviture associates through. We, we also have a, uh, you know, I, I think Emily mentioned assessment, which is like getting it right up like, you know, 50% of the battle, right? And, you know, and so I think that we have the ability to assess both non-technical and technical resources map them to a, 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 um, a, a training plan, right? And create, create a pathway to success. So, you know, what I wanna leave everybody with, you know, here in closing, Mike, is that, um, that there are resources in your region. Um, everybody is, you know, and there's some, some subject matter expertise around talent and talent strategy. And, um, you know, you don't have to do it by yourself. Uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Mike. Yeah, and I appreciate that. Thanks, John, for walking through that. Um, we have a number of questions coming in. We're going to try to get through all the questions. If not, we'll make sure that we uh, we respond to them uh, when I send out the, the deck and, and email as well. But um, one of the questions as I transfer back, as I come back to you, Melanie, um, that I see in the window is how do, the, how do you register? How do you engage? So maybe when I come back through with, with additional questions, maybe you can talk through that. So Melanie, you know, what recommendations would you make to this group of, you know, HR recruiter executives, you know, and the best way to engage with, with NOVA? Yeah, and I think John and Mark and Emily have all brought this up in their remarks that we're all in this together. So NOVA, George Mason, Smoothstack, Reviture, we're here as a resource to partner because we want to make sure that we're responsive to business needs. So you being here, we would love to talk with you and figure out what that could look like. And, you know, Mark had talked about, you know, tell us what's missing. What, what more could we be doing of, or what are we not doing enough of? But I think first and foremost, as obvious as this may be, recruit from our programs. NOVA, like George Mason and other institutions and organizations, we have a career services team, we have a career services management system. If you're looking for talent, make sure to post that employment opportunity on our job boards, in addition to the great resources that Mike has shared with us. We're directing our students to these resources. Um, and so if there is this, an opportunity for them to apply and join your team, help us by communicating that opportunity to our students and alumni. And building on that, we know that 80% of NOVA students are looking for a career readiness opportunity when they come to us. Um, so whether it's an internship, an apprenticeship, a professional development workshop like interview preparation or resume review, we're always looking for the subject matter experts, you, the business community, to work with us to provide that feedback real time to our students. Um, so those are a couple of ways, but I think most importantly in building on the themes that we were just talking about is lend us your subject matter expertise. 
It's really important for us to work hand in hand as education and training providers with the business community to understand the needs of the current workforce and the future workforce. And we're not going to be able to do that independently as a silo on our own. So we really need your input. And a couple of ways we do that at NOVA is we have industry advisory boards um, where members of the business community are able to participate as subject matter experts and give us an annual review multiple times throughout the year on our applied programs taking a deep dive into the curriculum to tell us what might apply, what needs to change, and put, set, um, put a set of recommendations forward for us to make updates to make sure that we are setting our students up for success and achieving their career goals. And then also consider teaching for us. What better experience than to have an industry expert like you or a member of your team to come teach one of these training programs or courses at NOVA to not only teach the technical skills that will be expected when you move into your job, but also to tell and instruct and share how those technical skills will be applied in the workforce. It's a really valuable learning experience. So that's another opportunity. And then finally, help us think through how to address barriers. We've talked a lot about IT and the economic opportunity and career opportunity in that sector in Northern Virginia, but we know that 90% of IT job postings require a four-year degree. So we would really appreciate the opportunity to work closely with you to figure out what other opportunities, whether it's through apprenticeship or internships or other models where we can support individuals in breaking into the IT sector. Um, so looking forward to continued conversation around that. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Melanie. I appreciate it. Um, Mark, back over at uh, George Mason, I mean, what, where, where's working with employers work best for Mason? Yeah, sort of that theme of, again, how do they engage as well? Yeah, and I'll try to answer that. And also, I think Matt has a question that I, I noted about um, how this micro-credential um, process is different from some of the existing micro-credentials that are out there. Uh, and I, where micro-credentials work best is when employers are really involved in them, uh, not just in terms of the um, development and design of the micro-credential, but actually being involved with the students who are coming through the pipeline. So at George Mason, we've created something called micro-credentials at Mason, which is just designed to make accessing the Mason experience a little easier um, and more digestible. Um, degrees are very large commitments. We've taken that idea and applied it to the, this talent exchange concept where it's not just about understanding what employers need, but getting their commitment to advise and counsel um, students that are coming through that micro-credential. To be able to say, look, here's what it leads to. Here's what we do in our business. Um, or even something as simple as, I'll take a look at your resume. Uh, in the context, again, of the, the Mason um, Talent Exchange, that confidence for someone who has been displaced um, is critically important. Um, to know that there's someone who's going to talk to you on the other side and to know that if I call someone, they get reached. Uh, and to know that someone's gonna be paying attention to my resume when it comes through the thousands of resumes that are coming through. So that's part of why micro-credentialing at Mason is a little bit different and how we're thinking about it. Um, we have done, as I mentioned before, some great work with, with Amazon, obviously a, a unique kind of employer in the region, but we've also worked with other employers, understanding what the knowledge, skills, and abilities are that they're looking for. And that allows us to line up in our micro-credential context, the things that we're already teaching that are of high value to you as an employer. Sometimes they get lost um, in all of the choices that students make in any degree program or any large university. So we're trying to make the signal a little bit more clear to the student. Why is this micro-credential valuable for me? I'm trying to make it a little bit more clear also to the employer. Why is this particular employee a uh, perfect fit for our organization? Um, so that's really the, the design um, of our micro-credentialing approach. I think um, there are lots of different micro-credentials to choose from. This one is, uh, is designed in particular under the Mason Talent Exchange for someone who's got a degree, who's got experience uh, and, and needs some confidence. Um, I think Mason helps provide that with our, our faculty as well. Great, thanks, Mark. Again, and and for the audience here, we're you know we're talking about one key, one one additional 
you know, type of resource for you to be thinking about on this upskilling and reskilling and leveraging talent from, from these organizations. So no, there's, there's a lot, lot more. So we'll try to again, get through those questions, but Emily, you know, what are you seeing, you know, um, you know, the employer's challenges are really in facing, you know, their attempt to train and upskill their existing workforce. I mean, what are you seeing from employers when you're engaging with them? Yeah, I actually, um, you know, I kind of touched on it in my answer earlier. One of the biggest challenges is assessing the, the talent that they have, assessing their own workforce. And uh, because there's usually, um, you know, a bunch of different types of skills that they're looking for. A lot of them definitely in the digital and IT space, cybersecurity, software engineering, that's, you know, where, um, you know, Reviture and, and SmoothStack, that's, that's a lot of what we specialize in because it is so, so incredibly tough, right, to, to um, hone and develop those skills um, when you're dealing with a, a limited time frame, right? So um, assessing the existing talent of your organization um, is absolutely one of the most challenging things. Um, and then also, you know, a lot of this training, it is, it's volunteerism, right? So it's, it's your own employee saying, hey, I'm willing to put in this extra work. Um, I'm willing to spend, you know, time away from my family on nights and weekends, because that's when this is happening in a lot of cases, right? Um, they're working, you know, an, an eight hour day, getting um, business as usual done, and they're putting in extra time and effort. And it's really hard for, um, you know, those employees to see the light at the end of the tunnel, right? If I put all this time and extra effort into this particular training program, um, where is that going to get me? Um, and it's very similar experience um, for, you know, college students, right? Um, I think Mark had said, you know, they're trying to identify if I put this work into this credentialing program or my four-year degree, what is that going to get me in the end? Is that going to land me a job? And it's really difficult to, you know, to paint that picture. I love that idea of having the employers get more involved through the process to really show like, here's the pathway. Um, you know, where this can lead. And I think for your um, internal training programs, it, the same idea applies. You're going to get more volunteers and more candidates interested in upskilling and reskilling, getting into these modern digital skill sets. If they can see that pathway, how is this going to lead to upward mobility for me, um, for my family, for my career, you know, three, five, 10 years down the road? How, how do I fit into this bigger, um, you know, trajectory? So, you know, assessing talent and identifying a clear pathway and kind of a light at the end of the tunnel for um, those internal employees um, to, you know, to, to really get them excited and get them involved, making sure you get them access to the right resources. And I have heard of large employers that we've talked to who have actually, um, you know, allowed people to kind of displace from that full-time job and fully dedicate to training. And those programs are although um, you know, risky and a more of a lift, highly successful, right? It's a huge commitment. They're devoting their you know, eight hours a day to really transforming their skill sets, um, moving into these um, new, more modern digital technology skills. And it's really great to see. So um, you know, definitely some challenges in there. How do we get business done as usual? How do we get people invested and involved? Um, and also how do, how do we do this right and making sure that, you know, the, whether you're leveraging an external partner, um, you're doing this internally or some combination of the two, so. Okay, thanks. Um, we sort of touched on, you know, we know all of you are helping address, you know, trying to help those transitioning that might have been laid off from industries around hospitality, retail, airlines, whatever during COVID. Um, so, we know you're all working on that. I'll, just for sake of time, I want to shift to just the last couple of quest, key questions, and then we'll we'll close out. Um, you know, John, um, how how do you how do you um, how do you address the typical attrition rate associated with contracted resources? I yeah, it, it's a good question, and it's a it's a major pain point uh, for for employers. Uh, you know, you typically you see in um, kind of in the marketplace somewhere between 15 to 20 percent uh, attrition uh, between contract resources. And a lot of times it's it's over it's over pay. Right. Um, and and so, you know, kind of uh, revenue attrition rate is somewhere between three and four percent. So it's just it's just an order of magnitude different. Um, our, once our resources are on assignment, they stick. And, and, and the reason for that is. 
Um, we do a very good job of screening resources up front. Um, you know, uh, everything from soft skills, technical skills, attitude and aptitude. And then once they get into our program, Mike, um, I mean, it, you know, the, it's a 10 week immersive hands on application development with the goal of outputting software developers and engineers that are, can be productive day one. And so we see about a, a somewhere around a 15 to 18% attrition rate within those first, um, you know, those first three weeks and where really people decide, hey, you know what, um, you know, maybe a career in software development isn't for me and they, and, and they opt out. And so that ensures that the people that kind of matriculate and graduate from, from Reviture um, are, you, are kind of the top um, cream of the crop and, and can be productive day one. You know, from a from a business model perspective, we guarantee our resources with our clients, and we don't get paid unless they're productive, right? So we have a we have a vested interest in ensuring that that that, that happens. Um, and then the other part of the stickiness is that the the uh, our clients have the opportunity to um, hire these resources and bring them on as full time uh, full time employees. And so typically, you know, we have young. Uh, students that are coming out that they have a you know certified um, uh, Salesforce developer working for uh, a large management consulting firm and they have an opportunity to become an employee of that company and that company doesn't recruit at their doesn't recruit at their campus right and, and so they're doing work um, that, that, that they're passionate about they're working have an opportunity to go full-time for uh, a company that um, they're you know very excited to work for so we, I mean, we have just like very, very little transition. 70% of the people um, that we put out, out on assignment convert to an, uh, a full-time employee of our clients um, within the first 12 to 18 months. Um, you know, and I, I saw some questions about like diversity and, and you know, Reviture diversity, we, we recruit nationwide, 700 colleges. We recruit nationally, we deploy locally. Um, all of our resources are, you know, clearable and, and, and can relocate to a client side at no cost. And so, you know, our, our diversity numbers, and we're, we're two times the national average, whether it's African-American uh, or any, you know, um, American of color. We're number six in terms of women in technology. We participate in a number of, like, um, a number of um, strategic partnerships. Uh, women in technology in New York is one of them. Um, and we focus not only on technology majors, uh, but non-technology majors. One of the best programmers I, since I've been at Reverse for the last six years that has come out has been a Bible major, right? Um, and because they just, you know, kind of think and approach problem solving from a little bit of a different, um, you know, a little different approach. So, um, you know, just to echo what I've said is I think that I think the resources, Mike, are out there uh, to help support your, your clients. And, you know, and I, as well as the other panelists, would be happy to help. Good. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Um, Emily, close us out real quick. Just why why skills based hiring? Why is it important? Important, and you know how can employers incorporate more of it into their into their planning? Sure. Um, yeah, I love talking about skills based hiring. Very very passionate about it, and um, I have you know some great stories similar to probably some of John's about some of the best people that I have seen come through the smooth stack program from all kinds of unique and different backgrounds. And one of my best stories is I had a, a new um, customer of smooth stack. And uh, one of the first things they always ask us is, you know, do all these people have four year degrees? And, you know, my typical answer is, well, no, you know, that would be silly. Why, 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 um, why limit our candidate pool? Right. Why don't we look at some other aspects? So we spend a lot of time talking with employers about skills-based hiring and starting to change their mindset about um, how they're assessing talent. Um, and so that particular um, company that I'm referring to had asked me to send them a list of the candidates we had in our program uh, for their particular cohort and stack rank them based on their um, previous years of experience and their degrees, how many degrees, what kind of degree they had. So I sent them that list and then what I did Additionally, was I had our technical staff assess um, those same candidates after being with us for about a month um, in terms of their performance and how they were working on the job. And that list was literally inverted. Um, the person with, um, I think, no college 
And, you know, us not much previous experience was our top ranked candidate. And it was so clear to me that this was a person flying under the radar. They just, they didn't have the resume. They didn't have the buzzwords, the previous experience. And as, as employers, and I'm, I fall into this category, I worked in, you know, IT staffing and recruiting for 12 years. It was my job to assess talent based on resumes, previous experience and buzzwords. And that I was trained. I looked at thousands of resumes every year. And I'm, you know, I was like discarding one, putting the one over here. And I had to retrain myself too to start to ignore those um, initial, you know, some is it, it's bias, right? We we can't help it, right? We're we're trained to look at things in a certain way. Put those biases aside and start to look at the way we're assessing talent based on the skills that they have today, they bring to the table. Um, this uh, candidate I'm referring to, he had been coding on his own since he was you know, in elementary school practically as, as a side hobby um, and had developed this really unique talent. And you know, at that point in his life, a four-year degree at you know, college, it wasn't for him. He wasn't ready for it. He wanted to stay focused on working and developing his craft. Um, and what a, what a talented, amazing individual. And if we weren't able to um, identify those skills that he had and bring them to the forefront for that employer, um, you know, he would have been missed. And I can't tell you how many, um, you know, highly talented individuals are out there um, and they're not even getting to the table for an interview. Um, they're, you're not getting a chance to meet these people. And so, you know, as a takeaway from this conversation about, you know, reskilling and upskilling, um, it's, it's also about um, identifying and attracting that um, kind of untapped talent pool out there, right? And one of the most important things we can do as a community is to focus on skills-based hiring and looking at unique, modern, and innovative ways of assessing that talent um, and helping them to get that leg up, get the career started that they deserve. And if you know they, they weren't ready for a four-year degree or even a two-year degree, but it's something that's a goal of theirs, how can we help them through you know, whatever program or pathway that they choose to participate in, um, how can we help them to still achieve those goals, right? And partner with our higher ed partners to get this talent that may have never even bothered applying or even looking at programs that are out there because they don't think that the traditional, you know, four-year um, degree is for them. Um, there, there is still a home for them and there's still opportunity for them to get involved and eventually maybe be one of those degree completers combined with, um, you know, the experience they're getting from on the job, from apprenticeship, from, you know, um, skills-based learning. So, um, you know, we have, uh, I think everyone here on this call um, has talked, given uh, several great examples of different types of skills-based assessments um, you know, and, and learning pathways that are available through all of these different programs. So I would definitely encourage um, if you're, you know, an HR, your um, you're company hiring, you're, you know, trying to um, look for ways to fill those talent gap, ta excuse me, talent gaps, um, skills-based hiring is where it starts, changing that mindset and really having that open conversation with your organization about um, some, maybe some of the fear behind it, fear of the unknown. Hey, we've never we've never hired someone without a four-year computer science degree. We've never hired someone, you know, who didn't have you know whatever um, previous experience. Well, if you've never done it before, you don't know that it won't work, right? So, um, you know, getting over some of those barriers, start small, do a pilot program, see how it works, get those individuals, um, you know, and you all have them, right? Especially in IT, right? Who who are pretty um, stuck in their ways. Um, try to show them the path forward and that this is the this is the future, right? This is the way that you fill the talent gap is is changing the mindset and focusing on um, you know some a different way to look at your talent. So great. Thanks. Thank you for all the panelists. I really appreciate it, Emily, uh, Melanie, Mark, John. Thank you. Um, appreciate the great insight and hopefully that's gotten um, some some wheels spinning and some some ideas flowing on how you can leverage these four organizations and leverage them all. Um, you, you know, 90,000 jobs out there, you guys need everybody. Um, let me close here quickly with um, a couple of comments. Um, let you know that, um, let you know that uh, these contacts, like I said, 
will be shared so that you have, you have everyone's contact information. I just want to close with saying thanks again for spending time with us. You know, we're, we're all, we're very focused on re retaining um, talent and bringing new talent here. There were a lot of questions we couldn't get to just real quickly. Um, one was, one was focused on um, early, you know, K through 12 range. We, um, Fairfax County EDA are going to be engaged next month with an, an effort to, to educate the um, K through 12s in the region on STEM and why you want to get into STEM and, and really grow a career here. And then we're working with organizations on the flip side, um, uh, 40 plus, those in transition or those that are, are well into their careers transitioning to something new. So we're working across multiple gamuts to try to help you fill that talent gap across the board. So engage us you know the county board of supervisors has entrusted us with a, a budget to really to really drive this program forward we want to hear from you engage us bring ideas um, with that said thank you we really appreciate your time this morning and uh, hope to hear from you soon thanks